The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you. The rulers sneered at Jesus and said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the chosen one, the Christ of God. Even the soldiers jeered at him. As they approached to offer him wine, they called out, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Above him there was an inscription that read, This is the king of the Jews. Now, one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. The other, however, rebuking him, said in reply, Have you no fear of God? For you are subject to the same condemnation. And indeed, we have been condemned justly. For the sentence we received corresponds to our crimes. But this man has done nothing criminal. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied to him, Amen. I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago, a man and I saw each other on the street, and we said, hello. We said, hello, and that began a conversation. And after 20 or 25 minutes, I I said to him, it seems like you're in a good place. We'll call him Kevin, and Kevin has a good sense of humor uh, about everything, and he, in a good place, he goes, well, I guess I live here on the sidewalk, but I guess I'm under an overhang and it keeps me dry when it rains. So I guess you could say I'm in a good place. But he knew what I was saying, and he, and he, he summarized what I was seeing. And he said, you know, I, I do spend my days promoting fellowship among the folks who live nearby. And in fact, I'm energized by the relationships I have with other people in my neighborhood. And then he said to the few of us who were out there walking around, he said, you know, the stuff that you guys bring, things like socks and water and sandwiches, Those things are are nice and they help, but those things would mean absolutely nothing if we weren't able to visit with each other, if we weren't able to listen to each other, if we weren't able to look each other in the face and smile at each other. Kevin reminded us that it is about relationship, and indeed I'm thankful for how he welcomed me into relationship and said, hello. It started with a hello. Today we celebrate the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe. We rightly acknowledge him as King of relationship. The scriptures point to the type of king he is and how he desires, how he came to restore us to right relationship with each other and with our Heavenly Father. In the the reading from the second book of Samuel, he's It points to Jesus as shepherd. It's that image of a ruler who sacrifices, who governs for the welfare of those who are entrusted to his care. That's our king. He's not a king who is one to raise armies and to make war, but he's a king who desires to reign over our souls, to bring us uh, new life and to lead us through faith, hope, and love into his kingdom of eternal love, heaven. The psalm reminds us that the new Jerusalem is not an earthly city. The new Jerusalem is heaven, and it's an abode of shared communion, it says in that psalm. And it's the church on earth getting its identity from the church in heaven. And we realize that we can realize communion here on earth as we live in right relationship with God and with our neighbor. 
In other words, it puts us in a good place, you could say. St. Luke lets us know how God desires us and how he's always waiting to accept us back into relationship with him. This scene on the cross, even from the depth of Jesus' suffering, hanging unjustly on the cross, we're reminded that he still is ready to accept our repentance, even while we are rightly condemned by our sin. And in response to our repentance, he offers us, he promises us new life. He is the king of relationship. This jubilee year, this extraordinary jubilee year of mercy has been a big help for many people. Perhaps for you yourself, it's been a year of extraordinary opportunities to be reminded of God's mercy for us, to receive that, and yes, to as we say at the end of Mass, to be merciful, just as our Heavenly Father is merciful. Pope Francis also this morning reminded us that that year was simply a reminder of what is always essential. Mercy is always essential. Many of you over the last several months have not jokingly said, what's next? We don't know what's next. What do we do after the Jubilee year of mercy ends? And I, and I get it. There's a desire to grab on to something tangible to help perpetuate this good momentum that we have, right? So I did a little research on our behalf. I've checked, and as Father said, uh, God is still merciful starting tomorrow, uh, and, and we're still allowed to show mercy to others, even, even tomorrow after the Jubilee year of mercy ends. But if you're also looking for something of how the church is continuing to lead us and give us language and shared language, the, uh, there's great things happening at both a national and a local level. Just last week, on November 15th, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops voted to approve their strategic plan for the next several years. And I'm excited to share the title of that strategic plan. Encountering the mercy of Christ and accompanying his people with joy. Encountering the mercy of Christ and accompanying his people with joy. Among the many priorities of the strategic plan, I'm excited to emphasize what I think is a, is a theme through there. And it's things like evangelizing, sharing the good news of Jesus through personal encounter. Evangelizing through personal encounter and also upholding the sanctity of human life. Yes, from conception to natural death with a special concern for those who are poor and vulnerable. Evangelizing through personal encounter and upholding the sanctity of life from conception to natural death with a special concern for those who are poor and vulnerable. That's at the national level. That's something that we can grab onto and live into, right? And, and also last week, last week was a great week, because also last week, the Washington State Catholic Conference, the bishops of, of our state, promulgated a pastoral letter on poverty. It's called, Who is My Neighbor? And basically, it prompts us to encounter others personally, especially those who are poor and vulnerable. You might recognize the title of that pastoral letter, Who is My Neighbor, as the question that the scholar of the law asked Jesus in the 10th chapter of Luke. Who is my neighbor? To which Jesus replied by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. The pastoral letter on poverty reminds us that poverty has a face. Poverty has a face that poverty is more than a problem to be solved. And just as Jesus told the scholar of the law to go and do likewise, Jesus calls us into relationship with our neighbor. And that's a much greater challenge than trying to solve a problem. Called into relationship. But we're reminded that poverty has a face. Poverty has a name. And as we listen to those experiencing poverty, we learn that poverty has a voice. Poverty has a voice. But poverty has a voice that cannot penetrate walls. Poverty's voice cannot penetrate walls like fear. 
and like misconception, and it can't penetrate walls like prejudice. And we're told that those walls currently exist between those who are suffering from poverty and those who have what they need. Here's more good news. As we are anointed at our baptism with Jesus, priest, prophet, and king, we have the power in Christ to live a life that is sacrificial, to speak words of truth and love, and to govern with him for the common good. We have the power in Jesus to enter into relationship with our neighbor. Christ has triumphed over all that divides us. Christ came to reconcile us. And walls of division crumble under the power of Christ's name. But you might be looking for something a little bit more tangible. Well, so what do I do next? Well, I humbly offer, uh, based on my reading, my studying, my prayer, and some of my lived experience, I humbly offer a few things that we can all maybe continue to do or maybe try to do a little bit more. Say hello. Say hello. So many people approach me and say, I see people in need. I don't know what to do. Can you tell me what they need? What should I give them? And as we talk a little bit, we recognize that hello is probably the best thing that we can begin to give them because hello means that you see them. Hello means that uh, you can acknowledge them and that they're communicating with another person. And a hello, if they're interested, with a hello, you might get a no thanks, move on, and that's fine, respect boundaries, right? But as you approach someone with a hello and if they respond and they desire a connection, uh, be ready to listen. A hello often leads to a chance to listen because poverty has a face and poverty has a name and so you'll hear a name and beyond the name, as you stay in that moment, you'll hear a story and you'll recognize the gift of being invited onto the sacred ground of another's experience. And in the name of Christ, you will have the power to listen to even the greatest trauma that someone has experienced or is experiencing. And in Christ, you'll be able to let them know that they're not alone. And you'll be able to say things like, I'm with you. Hello and listen often leads to a chance to affirm the dignity of the person that you're in front of. Affirming dignity. Because with God's ear, we can hear uh, the child of God speaking a story. And we can affirm their inherent dignity and remind them that they are valuable. You can remind a suffering person that they have value. And you will very often find that someone who is newly affirmed and seen again will recognize that they don't have to be alone and they have a desire to go home or they have a desire to take advantage of resources that have been offered to them all along. And often that person who's affirmed will desire to reconnect with their family and that family is so often waiting to receive them. A hello often leads to a listening and leads to a great chance to affirm the dignity of a person which leads to perhaps one of the greatest joys and challenges, and that is the last one, accepting. Accepting our brothers and sisters, as the pastoral letter says, allowing them to take their rightful place in our communities. Those who have lived so far on the margins and in despair and feeling shunned and rejected often don't feel worthy to re-enter communion. Just as Christ accepted the repentant thief, he asks us to go and do likewise. Now, it's tough to give what we don't have. So some of these steps, even as simple as they sound, might be very difficult. Saying hello, listening, affirming, and accepting. Perhaps you need to take a risk and allow someone to say hello to you. Take advantage of someone who might desire to listen to you and to affirm you and accept you. If you're not experiencing that offer from someone, know that God in Jesus perpetually says hello to you. God exists to listen to you, to affirm you, to accept you. 
My sisters and brothers, through his church, Jesus continues to call us to encounter his mercy and to accompany his people with joy and to uphold the sanctity of life with a special concern for the poor. Poverty has a face. Poverty has a name. Poverty has a voice. Today, especially, we call on the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ, who allows us to receive his love and invites us to govern with him for the common good. Pope Francis famously said in the joy of the gospel, I want a church that is poor and for the poor. They have much to teach us. We need to let ourselves be evangelized by them. This happens in relationship. And relationships can begin by simply saying hello. Hello.